and welcome back to Watch Us Tonight. I'm your host, Tim Masso. Friends from Far Flung, thank you for joining me. We've got a hell of a slate tonight. We're talking Rolex's weaknesses, my favorite Zenithel Primeros from a half century of the great chronograph, major brand watches that should have been bigger hits and why they're great used buys, all of this and viewer wrist shots this evening. There is no better place than the bigger and better and faster, thewatchbox.com, when you're ready to buy, trade, or sell watches, particularly when you're looking to sell. We pay fast, we pay cash, we make the process a no-brainer, and if you're looking to buy, as ever, we have over 2,000 watches live right now, ready to go globally 24 hours a day. Plus, they pay me. That's really good. Okay, jumping into the box right here, we've got Pilot Style 123 from Ireland. First in, Edward Ledden from Sweden, Jason Chan from New York City. Welcome, guys. I got to remind you that I'm willing to pay you for your time on my website because I'm giving away an Omega Seamaster Railmaster, the Star of Basel 2017, 40 millimeters, black dial, full bracelet, box, and papers, but you got to be in it to win it. Link in the description. Sign up. I'm announcing the winner at the end of this month. And finally, a bit of shameless self-promotion, because it's really all about me. Please join me on Instagram, Tim underscore Maso. Help me fill that gap and hit 50K in 2K19. All videos, all watch reviews, and I put a lot of the weird and wonderful stuff there that I may not have the time to shoot in my full-length watch reviews. Updated daily, Tim underscore Maso on Instagram. Now, if you were wrist shots, you sounded off, and I'm sounding back. Dan V chills with his Grand Seiko SBGV 247 by the shores of Lake Michigan. A wonderful 9F anniversary piece. Nicholas L takes the wheel with his Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Offshore Diver, the 15710. Jordan O and the Three Amigos truly do dazzle on a watch roll. One hell of a non-wrist shot, but all the same, send me any shots you've got of your watches. If they're that good, John V and a friend, Take a Damasco DA45 for a long walk on a short leash. Man's best friend in the background. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag or your watch shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on these pixels. Jumping into the box, we got some friends. Turkish Meister from Europe, well, properly from Turkey. Phil Payton, hello from New Hampshire. We've got Josh V from Salt Lake City. We've got the Pox Box from Bad Homburg, Germany. And we've got Glenn W from the UK. Joe R, Tim, thoughts on ball watches? I love them. You get a ton of watch for the money. Some of their proprietary technologies are brilliant. For a company that only has half of its building dedicated to its watches, the other half is Juvenia, they are one hell of a brand. Great value, innovative, spectacular proprietary technologies, and alongside Rolex, the best bracelets in the business. A good buy new and even better buy pre-owned. And right here we've got Aaron C. joining from Melbourne, getting up early with me, and Wrist Royce from Seattle on the left coast. Guys, thanks for shining. Thanks for sounding off and shining brightly. And Jason Maine's actually in the box answering all your questions. He's there with his no-date sub about our watches. So he's my wingman on the E side of things. Okay, Avi T asks, Tim, this show seems a bit more bouncy lately. Are you chugging coffee, Red Bull, or uh, something else? Well, my little friend, I got to admit, is my usual pre-program array of crocus hits. That's right. The Swiss metal hit list is the ultimate warm-up and pump-up music for a watch broadcast. Metal Rendezvous, 1980, Bedside Radio. That's my, that's my warm-up before the show. Now, Bobby L. asks, Tim, is there anything Rolex doesn't do well? Yes, dress watches. This is true for the entire Cellini collection and many of the gold and two-tone oyster case timepieces that aren't rotating bezel Pantheon sports models. During the 2000s, let's rewind about 15 years, Rolex put a ton of money into resurrecting the historic Prince model, which was a rectangular case from the 1920s and 30s, with the explosive dials and matching display case backs of the Cellini Prince line. These were truly impressive watches, richly appointed, beautifully finished, thoughtfully designed, and they sold slowly. Today, you can find these decadent precious metal, and they were all precious metal models, for 50% of their retail prices from the last decade. That's right, 50% of what they cost in 2005, 6, 7, 8. These are incredible buys. Now, 
In 2014, I should mention that Rolex ended the Prince line altogether and rebooted the Cellini as a full line collection. 39 millimeters, new complications, new models, all precious metals, and few found favor with buyers. The problem, as ever, Rolex dress watches. The market doesn't know how to respond to these, and it starts comparing them with things that, frankly, do outshine Rolex in the segment. Everything from FP Journe to Langa to Patek Philippe, and better value dress watches even from segment competitor Omega. Now, all Cellini models pale next to what happened three years after these bowed when we got the Cellini moon phase. The reference 5535 should have been the full reset for the line. Everyone thought collectors would clamor for this. It was Rolex's first new moon phase watch since the 1950s. That moon phase disc is a patented enamel process. That's right, it's an enamel moon phase disc. It's a pointer date, and the moon itself inside that little disc is a piece of meteorite. If this didn't get it done, nothing would. And frankly, it's looking like nothing would. Because right now, you can find this watch in cases, available with no delay, right out of the box. All Cellini models are ready and waiting in dealer cases globally, not just stateside, right now. Oyster case models, I should mention, in precious metal, often get the dress watch treatment from Rolex buyers. Nowhere is that more evident than in the Date 8 40. It succeeded the 41 millimeter Date 8 2, which was the previous big president back in 2015, and collector response has been cool. Despite new dials that are laser etched, three-day power reserve, the new movement, 3255, and a bracelet rendered stretch-proof by ceramic-coated pins. You get a lot with the Date 840. But here's the deal. Only the ultra-rare Eastern Arabic numeral dial truly excites collectors. That's a watch that, when it comes on the market, sells at auction or at a huge markup over retail. And it was unofficially, but officially, created as a special edition for Siddiqui of Dubai. So this is a special watch. Every other Date 840 gets treated like a Cellini. If you want one, they're available. And if you want one pre-owned, they're available for less than retail. Or, like I said, you can just stop by your dealer and buy one and get the full new Rolex treatment and all five years of factory warranty. But this is where Rolex has misfired. If you want to learn more about this, go back about four weeks and check out my new Rolex watches you can buy now at episode where I go through every watch from the Rolex catalog, mainstream stuff, not gem set ladies watches, but all the men's watches that I saw personally in Rolex cases at Rolex dealers in the United States in four of our major cities. Now, Edmund G asks Tim, but let me go back to the box for a second right here. Steve Mauger just joined. Greetings from Guernsey. Thanks for joining me. And we've got Patrick Chip saying Obama wears a Cellini. I haven't caught that yet. How did I miss that? And then Ben Clymer, not Ben Clymer, but Ben Clymer, that's my mime impression, saying, build a wall for the watch? I don't know. Politics neutral. We're not left or right, blue or red. Let's keep it clean. And then right here we have, what's up, Jason Main from Dustin Van Patten, a fan of our Thursday host. And right here we've got Abu Sadiq joining. Hi, everyone. And then we've got Amar El Shia. Hello, gentlemen. Amar, welcome. Okay, guys. Edmund G asks Tim, can you share your favorite Zenith El Primero models since this year is the 50th anniversary? You better believe I can. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and I hope to yours, because I love the El Primero in all its forms. Everything from the Espada time-only non-chronograph El Primero to the Fuse Tourbillons of the Academy range. It's been a great ride, but most of my choices are fairly basic. We'll start in terms of veterancy, the oldest watch first. The first complicated watch I ever desired was a watch I shopped on eBay back before Chrono was a thing. In the mid-2000s, the 1975 El Primero TV screen, example shown. A monster for its time at 40 millimeters and Zenith's piece of the 1970s integrated bracelet action. If you're into the Rolex Oyster Quartz, the Jumbo Ingenieur, the Royal Oak, the Nautilus, the Gerard Perigo Laureato, this was very much in that vein and it's an El Primero after that tradition. Find a black dial example and you've got something that's almost incalculably rare as only a few dozen of those survive and there's also a Movado branded version of the blue dial because Movado and Zenith were one company at the time. I'll also mention that my f second favorite is going to be the 1995 to 2001 
Chronometer certified Chronomaster Triple Calendar Moon Phase. This 40 millimeter Gaudron bezel watch is pretty close to the perfect timepiece. 40 millimeters stainless steel Zenith L Primero automatic COSC certified Triple Calendar Moon Phase with a chronograph. You really don't need anything else. Now they continued production of this watch after 2001, but without the chronometer certification. My advice, if you're going to join me in my love affair with this model, get one with the COSC certificate. It's worth going the extra mile, and these are cheap. I'm talking like four to five grand pre-owned. Third, the 1997 to 2002 Rainbow Flyback. This is interesting because this is a true pilot's watch and probably one of the last mechanical watches designed for a military contract order. French, by the way. A timepiece that as I've advanced as a collector, I've deeply regretted not purchasing when I had the chance. As I evolve as a collector and move sort of into, I guess, a veteran status on that front, I regret not buying good examples of the true vintage and near vintage models that have come across my desk during the video series. This was a watch that I should have picked up, and if you're smarter than me, you'll pick one up minimally if ever refinished, full box and papers, bezel with tritium pearl intact, tritium dial intact on the full bracelet. Again, that is a what might have been. I had it in my hand, I had it on my wrist. Guys, that would be number three on my El Primero all-timer list. Then there's the 2003 to 2009 Chronomaster XXT Open. And I know you're asking, Tim, a 45 millimeter Terry Natoff era Chronomaster, are you serious? I am, and there's a special story. This one has sentimental value. It was the first Zenith watch that I experienced in person, sort of as a kid, right out of college, after having been aware of the brand's reputation in Europe, but have having only read about it. This was the beginning of Zenith in the United States. Terry Nataf established Zenith's distributorship, and finally, I could see these watches new. This was in 2008, just before I joined the Navy, so I had that on my mind. That was coming up, and I remember being deeply impressed by the quality and the substance, as well as the fact that this 45 millimeter watch fit on my spindly wrist. It was truly a four lug event. I was in awe of this thing. And I thought somebody would have to do something incredible to deserve such a watch. I was overawed by the experience, and I remember it vividly. It just took my breath away. I think all of us have had a watch like that in, in our lives, in our career as collectors. It may not have been objectively the most incredible watch we've ever encountered. It's not a Grubel, it's not a Dufour, it's not even a jean frederic Dufour era Zenith, but it was a watch that absolutely captivated my heart and my mind. So I remember this one well. And when that watch comes into our office today, and we have it available pre-owned, I revert to the mindset of the awestruck kid who knew nothing about watches. It still has the same impact because of what it meant to me at that formative moment in my life. And I'm sure all of us have a watch like that. So sound off in the box and let me know what your early awestruck watch was. Jump into the box right here, Dustin Van Patten. Tim, do you think Rolex will eventually release a triple date moon phase or perpetual? I think we will eventually see a triple date chronograph, a Jean-Claude Killy, albeit with a moon phase. I think that is going to happen. You will see a complicated chronograph sometime in the future. And then right here, I could see Kyle K say images are stretched all funny. That's because I'm a funny guy. I distort the picture. No, we'll look into it. We'll look into it. Just like you told me I look too blue on this new set, we're looking into that as well. Right here, we've got friends from around the world. Aaron Murphy asking, Tim, what is the next big color for dials? Green, emphatically green. And I'll also say this, if it's not going to be one color, it's going to be gradients. I saw a ton of that this year at Basel and SIHH. People are starting to crib the gradient look from brands that have been doing it forever. Patek, I give you credit, 5711, 2006. But the gradient dial effect is here to stay, and I think green is the next big thing. Green, and maybe even, maybe even a bronze gold. I'm seeing a little bit of that too. Right there, we've got Matthew D. joining from Kent, England. We've got John Dandola joining from my old neck of the woods on Long Island in New York. And we've got Christopher G. Hello, gents. Glad to be here for the live show. Christopher, thank you for making my live show. JBO Surf joining in from Adelaide, Australia. And Blue Shirt Buddha, a regular in the box. 
We got Sutat, who says, whenever I see the Zenith star, I always think Soviet Union. Well, it's not a red star after all, so I can forgive you for the association, although I'm sure, ultimately, there is some Soviet knockoff of the El Primero. Maybe you can have your red star and wear it too. Okay, next up on my list, the Zenith El Primero Captain Windsor annual calendar. This is one that was previewed in 2010 and made available shortly thereafter, and it's the bee's knees. It's the best of everything. It's a good size at 42. It's a stainless steel watch in almost all of its variants, so you're not paying for precious metal. And it is co-equally my favorite mainstream, that is non-high complication, not bu non-budget bursting El Primero. Alongside the unwearably huge Zenith Double Matic, this has to be my favorite mainstream El Primero complication. It has an annual calendar designed by Ludwig Oxlin, who created everything from the Ulysse Norden Trilogy of Time to the current generation of Ox und Junior independent brand perpetual and annual calendars, which means that this is a rock solid and unbreakable calendar watch. I like, personally, the boutique edition smoked palladium from about five years back they were doing the gradient thing too and it's lovely because it's a sort of wave gradient where there's a narrow bar of light colored silver through the middle and then it's almost a brown bronze at the top of the bottom that's the one to own a hallmarked palladium precious metal smoked fume dial on a ludwig oxlin annual calendar with the zenith el primero finally and this might be a little bit controversial there's the Rolex Daytona. The most famous El Primero chronograph of them all is not a Zenith, and it's on my top five list. That's not the controversial part, though. Everyone likes the Daytona, but the sodalite dial of my dreams is controversial. Can we go full screen with this one, guys? Because folks need to see all the details for better and for worse. I've given this a great deal of thought, and I can live with or even embrace the dial diamonds, which were mandatory on this model, the white gold Rolex 16519 Sodalite. I understand the challenge many have when coming to terms with diamonds on a men's watch. I'm at peace with it because this one is rare beyond any steel cosmograph from that era. The steel watch was the sex bomb. There was a waiting list. It became legendary. But this one is even less common and special beyond measure for having that marbled blue Sodalite rock dial. Now, here's the thing. It's like a love affair with a woman who is perfect in every way except for the consequential fact that she keeps a ferret. No weasels, game over, red light, return to sender. Or, 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 do you pull an upset? If you're really bothered by the gems, find a way to live with it. Because if she's really that good, you'll find a way to live with the ferret. And if you still can't get over the soda light dial with its diamonds, you like the soda, but you're light on the diamonds, you can throw this admittedly strap only Zenith El Primero on a blue NATO strap to reassert or even overassert your manhood, which would be like settling the ferret issue in the home with your pet King Cobra. Step off, weasel, you don't know me like that. Speaking of the Rolex Daytona, we often discuss watches that already dominate the bandwidth and the chat space on YouTube. I want to talk about four models that deserved to be bigger hits and never quite made it. We're not talking about failures, but they weren't the success stories that they could have been. These are a cautionary tale to manufacturers and watch journalists because on paper, all four looked like born winners at the time of launch. Starting with the Rolex Daytona, the 2013 Rolex Daytona anniversary. Now this one, we can call it the anniversary image. There it is right there. Plentiful pulchritude. But this one still puzzles me because we were in the heart of the current cycle's economic upswing. Things were looking good and getting better. This was the first ever series production platinum Rolex Cosmograph. The Daytona then and now, a core Rolex model, one of the big three with the GMT and the sub, and the combination of chocolate bezel, white case, and blue dial was a consensus stunner. I can almost taste a York peppermint patty when I look at that bezel and that dial. It's that crisp and that savory or should I say sweet. Moreover, 2013 was a big year for the Daytona in general. 50 years of the Rolex Daytona, a big round number anniversary, and it was the year of the now quasi-infamous Christie's 
Lesson 1 Daytona auction that grossed over 12 million Swiss francs, and it was basically a warm-up for the Daytona auction excesses to follow. Insanity reigned, and somebody not named Madonna paid 75,000 at that auction for this. Okay, now I'm not at peace. There's no peace with that. That's like a woman who breeds ferrets. Sorry, ain't gonna happen. But I'll say this, with a retail value of 75,000 back in 2013, the landmark 50th anniversary Rolex Daytona didn't catch on. Today, it remains a model with lax demand at dealers. The kind of watch that's available, there's no wait, but it's rarely requested, and dealers don't want to hold it because it's like having a V12 BMW 7 Series on the lot without a buyer already in hand. Dealers don't want to carry what is now an $82,000 Rolex watch without a firm order prior. Sure, the retail price of $82,000, 82 grand it remains steep, but we've seen people throw more money at Nautilus 5712 moon phases, 5726 annual calendars, and all manner of vintage Rolex models, including Daytonas, that are less significant in the scope of history than the Platinum Cosmograph, the Plasmograph which I should mention remains my second favorite Rolex model behind the Milgauss Z Blue. The Milgauss Z Blue is incredible and it's exclusively on the basis of price that I prefer this one over that Platinum Daytona. That's saying something considering I'm not a Rolex guy and I can embrace all four lugs with both arms here, both watches. Other issues, I wish people throwing stupid money at Patek 5980 Nautilus chronographs would consider the anniversary Daytona instead. The Rolex used would leave $40,000 still in the bank to have more fun with other watches compared to what you would pay buying that watch used versus a Nautilus chronograph used. Those are now about $105,000 to $110,000. Go for the Rolex Daytona. No one's going to look, if you're into status, if you're all about and only about status, no one's going to look down at your wrist, see a platinum Rolex Daytona and say, oh, it should have been the Nautilus. Not in a world where people are paying double list for the steel Daytona. Trust me, if you're into status, get the platinum Daytona. If you're into substance and not just style, get the platinum Daytona. If you just want a smarter and better buy than the Nautilus chronograph, get the platinum Daytona. It's the right, 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 right answer. Finally, I mentioned to Brian Govberg last week on Wednesday's show when I brought this watch onto the show that if this Daytona had arrived as a new model at Basel 2019 instead of 2013, the result would have been a meltdown at dealers and insane aftermarket markups. For once, Rolex just missed the mark with the right watch at the wrong time. Now jumping into the box right here. We got a lot of friends joining in. We got Jason Main saying, among, among subs, the Smurf is king. Horology Homies asking, do I like the rainbow? You must be joining us late. That was on my El Primero top five list. And then we've got High and Rising saying, Tim, you once said your favorite Rolex was the Quartz. If you consider a variant of a model, then yes, it's at least my top three. The white gold lapis style Oyster Quartz Daydate. I'm not sure if that's a model by itself or a variant. Model wise, it's going to be the Z Blue or the Platinum Daytona, but definitely that Oyster Quartz white gold lapis is on my list. And then right here, we've got Christopher Peterson saying that ice blue Daytona dial is gorgeous in real life. And then we've got Tim Masso's sunglasses saying as excessive as it is, the Platinum Daytona is ultra cool. All right, you guys, I can see you're into that watch, and so am I. This is stealth factor there. You got the stealth wealth thing, the watch that you know is precious metal, but everyone else thinks is steel. And the dude who recognizes that watch might actually be someone you want to strike up a conversation with. Okay, jumping into the box right here. A mad B saying, my next Daytona, wear it in great health and send me a wrist chat. 2015, the Omega Constellation Globemaster. I really thought this one was going to be a hit. For years, Omega fans bemoaned the 1982 to present Manhattan profile constellation, the one with the double griffin claws that they love in Asia and hate everywhere else. Why? Because the 1950s Pi Pan Constellation chronometer was the Connie that the Omega purists and the historicists frankly demanded, and they weren't getting it. There was the debut DeVille coaxial in 1999, and then seldom after. If you accept this griping at face value, the arrival of the Connie Globemaster in the Omega catalog as the new Pi Pan and the true successor to the Pi Pan, it should have met with waves of orders for the new watch. And who knows, maybe up front there were waves of orders. 
It didn't happen for two reasons. This watch could have been a hit, but Omega blew it. That's why I say there might have been orders, but I also think they might have been cancelled. Because the energy of the launch, and there was huge energy around this watch at Basel 2015, had dissipated by the time the watch started shipping a year later. The new Master Chronometer Standard, if you remember when that was new, it debuted on this watch. And it's possible that production difficulties with the new Master Chronometer movements are attributable to the slow rollout of this model. But I remember being at Basel World in 2016 at the Globemaster annual calendar, the follow-on model lines launch in 2016, wondering if we would even see the 39mm time-only date constellation Globemaster before we saw the annual. They were that slow. 12 months later, people did not have the watches, which is why I say there may have been orders, but people run out of patience. They cancel, they move on, and this watch missed out. I'll also say that second, the other reason this watch wasn't a huge hit, it was a victim of pundits and retro grouches who talk a big game. When given the chance to actually lay down green, or red, or whatever color your money might be, and by a modern day pie pan, even a handsome full bracelet model, the retro grouches and the journalists and the so-called dyed in the wool Connie loyalists did not buy this watch. They bought Seamasters and they bought Speedmasters and left it at that because that's what Omega sells and that's what Omega buyers buy. Now new, these sell for 6,900 on a strap, 7,200 on the bracelet and steel. It's a good buy. Five-year warranty, I can't argue with the value. You get a lot. But pre-owned, you can get one of these on the bracelet for five grand, and you can get it on the strap boxes, papers, and remaining warranty for four grand. So a watch that never caught on, that might still be a thing, but you know what they're worth. Here, monetary value and hype do not equate to substantive value. Make this the buyer's opportunity in a buyer's market. Okay, 2015. I don't talk about JLC much on the show anymore, but Jager LeCoultre remains one of my favorite brands. And in 2015, it looked like they had a good thing about to happen. The Geophysic Universal Time. Turn back the clock one year prior. In 2014, the tribute to Geophysic line was easy to like but tough to love. The words like plain, sanitized, antiseptic. Anodyne were rolled out to describe a watch that was true to history, but just not exciting. The 2015 41.6mm World Time Geophysic should have solved that problem with a lush dial of brushed metal continents, gradient lacquered oceans, and a lovely media blasted 24-hour scale and World City reference ring. It was a good-looking watch with immense drama and dial depth. It was loaded with Tech 2. All of the caliber 772 technologies carried over from the 2000s Auto Tractor, which basically made JLC Auto Tractor movements as tough as Rolex movements, but there were additions because the new movement offered the high-tech Gyro Lab yoke-style balance. They actually increased the aerodynamic efficiency of it and made it look like a Jager LeCoult logo on both sides. Yes, they calculated aerodynamic losses and they created maximum polar moment. Plus, they added a deadbeat seconds technology in the Caliber 770 series, so it had a remarkable complication on top of a world time complication. And yet people just kept buying reversos. No one stuck around for this one. There were no wait lists, no order books were overfilling, I didn't see them marked up on secondary markets, and today the Geophysic Collection seems like a relic of a previous brand reboot for JLC, even as the Polaris Collection seems to have supplanted the role of the Geophysic line as the historically oriented sports watch, even while a new JLC CEO seems interested in moving the brand away from this kind of watch towards dress watches, high complications, and high horology. That's not a bad thing, but they're moving away from one of their best recent efforts, and it's almost like this watch came and went with a whisper when it deserved a roar. I could see you guys in the box are saying, Sean F., late to the show, thank you for joining me any way you can. Sean, I see Juan almost agreeing with Jean-Claude Beaver, he of the toothy grin, the particularly toothy grin. I can't see the the precedent comment, but I can see right here we got some friends who are saying that they like the JLC Geophysic, and Xavier N. saying, JLC, thanks to you, I'm getting the Polaris date. Wear it in great health. I used to be Mr. JLC, and I still love the brand, so when I speak about it, I still speak from the heart. And I can see right here, we've got 
Jean-Claude Beaver saying, I'd rather a Zenith over Omega any day. Call me crazy. You know what? I don't disagree with you. Omega is a big box brand. They're mass produced watches. It's a little bit of a soulless group brand. And I don't blame you for preferring a Zenith. That's a brand that still has soul. And I spoke to a Zenith watchmaker and he said, even inside of LVMH, there's still an emphasis on watchmaking at Zenith. It's still sort of a small family company inside. So I believe in the company and I believe in the products. And while I like Omega, I love Zenith. And I have to agree with you, Mr. Jean-Claude Beaver. Okay, by the way, we've got Edward Ledden right here saying, I need to quit my Richard Mille addiction, I think. That's an expensive habit. I opened the show with Scarface. You've taken it to the next level. Okay, right here, we've got... Yeti joining in from Sweden and Gordon Crawford saying, I love my JLC Geophysics. G-Man064 is saying, that is a beautiful watch. And John Dandola from Long Island saying, the JLC is an underspoken piece that deserves more love. Well, Tody Sanchez asks, Tim, would you prefer the JLC Polaris Chronograph or Daytona? Okay, Polaris Chronograph or Daytona. I'm assuming we're just talking about buying it at a dealer, no markups, no hype, no weights. I don't really love the Polaris collection. The Geophysic world... Geophysic Universal Time, I like that. I might take that over a Daytona. But if we're talking about a Rolex Daytona, and I'm a motorsports guy, I'm a car guy, I'm an endurance racing guy, I'm all about the Cosmograph right here. For me, the Polaris Chrono is a watch that never was. It's a what-if watch. If we're talking about a vintage Polaris, then yeah, I'm all about that over the Daytona. If we're talking about the Polaris Chrono, which doesn't quite steal my heart, versus a Rolex Daytona, which is like my childhood passion with motorsports wrapped up into a 40 millimeter camera, Case. Yeah, it's going to be the Daytona for me, and no second thoughts. Jumping back into the box, we got some more friends. Stormy Daniels, I said no politics, guys, saying no love for Swatch. I do love some Swatch brands. I still love Blancpain has a lot of potential, and I love Omega. I love Hamilton, they give incredible value, and Mito, which gives even more value than Hamilton. But I got to be honest, if it's between Zenith and one of those, I got to go with the star, folks. And then right here, we've got Brick Lane, who may own a Zeitwerk. And we've got Big Al saying, JBO Surf, he agrees with you that the lugs are too long. Let's see, what was the antecedent comment? He likes the World Timer Nachtblau, but the lugs are too long from Nomos. We got all sorts of comments going on in the box, but that's the fun of a live show. I can intercede and join in. Well, Mr. JKL joins in from Australia, getting up early. And we've got Dems Chen joining in from Germany. My opinion on the JLC Master Compressor GMT. I love that watch. In fact, I would say if you're looking at the Master Compressor GMT, you probably want to look for a few variants. There was a very cool and very limited Singapore Airlines longest flight limited edition that was rolled out in the 2000s. Try to find that one because it's very cool. And if you can be persuaded to look at the Dualmatic, which is the other master compressor uh, dual time travel watch, you should probably consider the Chelsea version. 200 pieces for Chelsea Football Club in Chelsea blue and truly special. That is a watch to remember. So much so that I almost bought the last one we had. That was three years ago and it's one of those watch purchases I regret not making. Non-buyer's remorse. Okay, and then we've got Mr. T-Bone saying Daytona every day from that comparison. Jumping into the box and jumping back to the topic at hand, the 2016 Vacheron Constantin Overseas. The 2004 Overseas, let's look back real quick, but that Overseas Generation 2 transformed what had previously been an undersized and slow-selling Omega Sports Watch, or I should say Overseas Line Sports Watch, into Vacheron's most important single model line. The Gen 2 made the overseas what it was in the 2000s and the 2010s. All of this occurred in spite of the fact that we had no Geneva Hallmark, solid case backs, and workmanlike outsourced calibers. This watch was hot at the right price. Now, here's the thing. On that basis, the 2016 Generation 3 Overseas should have been a revelation, but retail prices jumped by thousands of dollars for a model line that frankly often was discounted in its previous Generation 2 iteration. The result, with some of the chronographs in particular on full bracelet, was that price jumps as high as $10,000 were seen compared to what customers were used to paying for an Overseas, and for a lot of folks that was a deal breaker. It was just a quantum leap when they were looking for baby steps. It got worse. Late 2014 to early 2017 was a mini recession local entirely to the watch industry. 
Sales cratered for every brand across the board. Clients didn't have patience for massive price heights like on the Vacheron Generation 3, and the abrupt crash of sales meant that a huge number of overseas Generation 2 watches actually remained on the market, discounted, now competing with the full price Generation 3 watches, and it was no contest. Generation 3 fell on its face out of the gate, and everyone admits it. But there is good news here, and it's that the Generation 3 has a bit of a redemption story, and it's the exception to the previous tales of woe in this segment. Steel models are selling better today than in 2016. This is now a watch that has a lot of momentum behind it. And while there wasn't a whole lot of momentum behind the Generation 1 or Generation 2 automatic, the automatic version of the Generation 3 is now a strong selling watch. Moreover, the outrageous spike in Royal Oak and especially Nautilus pricing has considered forced people to consider taking a second look at the Overseas Auto, Overseas Chronograph, and even the precious metal ultra-thin no-date automatic, white gold only, and the white gold perpetual calendar. As Nautilus prices have gotten crazy and 5726s have crested $100,000, these start to make more sense at 55 grand and about 100 grand respectively. Pre-owned if you're looking at a Generation 3 overseas chronograph, think twenty dollars to $22,000, assuming both straps, the extra clasp, the full bracelet, boxes and papers, and maybe even remaining warranty. If you're looking at the automatic, that is a $19,300 watch that pre-owned is going to sell for about sixteen dollars to $17,000. So these are great pre-owned buys, and happily, the watch is starting to sell new as well. Jumping into the box right here, we have Turkish Meister saying, my ultra thin VC overseas gray gold is a grail watch for me. And then we have right here, Christopher Peterson saying, Tim, what's your take on the Grand Seiko price jump this year? I think Grand Seiko is making two mistakes. One, they're going way too far up market too quickly. And second, a lot of the new watches that are coming out are just too darned big. So I like the quality of what you get. I like the craft arts they, that they incorporate. I like Arushi, I like enamel. I like Zeratsu finished cases. I like everything they do right up to the Crador level. But the bottom line is the prices they're asking for Grand Seikos right now are approaching what used to be Crador pricing. And we're starting to see Seiko models priced at what used to be Grand Seiko pricing. And I don't think the market can tolerate that. Not when so many of the models are also huge. And it feels like all of the Spring Drive 20th anniversary watches are huge, just unwearably titanic. And then right here I could see we've got Brick Lane saying he'd love an early Zeitwerk. Yeah, you and me both. And then right here, we've got Simon Holt saying, I think the Vacheron Overseas might be my next and final big buy. Can't seem to get any more Rolex, even though I have Hulk, BLNR, Datejust 2, etc. 50th birthday is coming up. Hey, if you're looking at that kind of watch and you've got a Rolex collecting theme going, why not go absolutely crazy? Get the anniversary Daytona. A 50th anniversary for a 50th anniversary. Tell me I'm not wrong. It's the ultimate matchup, man. You only live once. And then right here, we've got Adam Dorney watching from Melbourne, getting up early and multitasking with me. Abdul saying, and Abdul is one of our great perennial supporters who sends me many wrist shots from at home and vacation, but he's saying the Generation 3 overseas has a great movement, but the size of the Generation 2 case is much better. I would say look at the automatic, the 41 millimeter, especially on the strap, which you get when you buy the watch. I think it's a better fit for a smaller wrist like mine than the Generation 2 automatic. The Generation 2 automatic was a 42. The Gen 3 automatic is a 41. And then right here, we've got Big Al asking, would it be crazy if VC put out a rotating bezel, a dive watch? It's a good question. First, it's been done. If you look up Vacheron Thunderbird, you'll realize that not only was there a rotating bezel, Vacheron, but it was the company's original sports watch before the 222. Vacheron Thunderbird, look it up, it's just like a Rolex Turnograph. But more to your point, would Vacheron release a dive watch? I think that's what you're really asking. Possibly. I think they would have to find a way to do it without making it like a Royal Oak Offshore Diver. But I think they've got some room to do this because Rolex doesn't play at that level with its dive watches. And Patek Philippe doesn't do dive watches. Langa doesn't do dive watches. And although AP does do dive watches, you can do a thin, fine, 
versatile quasi dress watch diver, something that is 13 millimeters thick, something that is versatile enough to wear with anything. It's easy to do a dive watch that doesn't turn into a Royal Oak Offshore. So yes, I think it can happen. This year we saw a few new overseas variants, most notably the Tourbillon. We've seen a few new dial versions, but it's been since 2017 before we saw a mainstream new model introduced, and that was the dual time. I would not bet against some sort of an overseas diver, but I think production has to be low, and it can't be a Vacheron Royal Oak Offshore diver. It has to be its own thing, and it would be something that Longa and Patek simply can't match because they don't do that type of watch. This would be Vacheron in the tradition of the Saltarello and the Sputnik, showing us just how crazy it can be when it wants to be. More questions. Let's do some more live Q&A, guys. I love doing this. I can see MT Bone saying, VCs are just too delicate. It's true, they're not built like Rolexes, but then again, you don't buy an overseas to go where a Submariner would go. And then right here, we have Brick Lane saying, Breguet should reissue a dive watch. This is controversial. True, there were Breguet dive watches in the past, but mid-century Breguet was a level of luxury that the modern-day Breguet doesn't always like to acknowledge. Oh, sure, there's the Type 20 and the Type 21, the pilot's watches, but if you look at a 20th-century Breguet from before the Chaumet brothers bought the company in the 70s, you're talking about watches that are built like any Blancpain or Rolex, which is to say tough but crude. So there is a fine line for Breguet to walk, between reissuing one of those watches and trying to cover up how debased its history became before Swatch started investing real money and prior to them, Chaumet. I'll also mention that Breguet doesn't have much room to maneuver. Omega makes some pretty expensive dive watches today and Blancpain covers the rest of that territory. Where is the room where luxury brands like Blancpain and now Glasuta Original are making vintage reissue divers. I don't see room for Brigade to muscle in, especially because it would mean basically abandoning the new marine line that they launched last year to the sound of one hand clapping. I mean, that collection landed with a thud, guys. So yeah, Brigade could reach back into its dubious 20th century history and find a dive model to reissue, but it would be a Me Too watch in an already saturated market. It would be a period of their history they don't like to acknowledge. They want you to think of Abraham Louis Brigade not the nearly derelict building in Paris prior to the resurrection of the brand. And they don't want you to think that Breguet is just like Omega and Geo and Blancpain, which it would be if it reissued a diver with a vintage vibe. Also, look into the box right here. You guys, keep them coming right here. Christopher Peterson saying he's all about the Blancpain Barracuda. You guys, you need to open a different tab, keep me streaming, and check out the Blancpain Barracuda Only Watch Special. You know I'm narrating the Arnold & Son auction video for their giveaway watch, and the only watch watches are dropping like, well, they're dropping like flies right now, which isn't to say they're dead, but they're coming from all over the place and they're swarming us at the moment. Patek, Arnold & Son, Blancpain, they're all coming out now, and I want you to look at those watches because we're going to talk about them on the next show. And right here we've got Seven River saying the Barracuda is gorgeous, and Jean-Claude Beaver asking, Tim, of watches you've reviewed, which one blew you away the most? The Zeitwerk video was pretty funny in that you were speechless probably for the first time ever. Okay, of all the watches I've reviewed, for me, the most special because of what it meant to our company was probably the Rolex 6239 Paul Newman Daytona. Christie's was unable to sell this watch. And Watch You Want, a company that consisted of 25 people in, I'd say, five rooms with a website that was hobby built, sold that watch, $30,000 above what was then marketed for that watch. And I was entrusted to make the video that ultimately sold it to a French oil executive in Singapore. And the magnitude of that responsibility for a company that small, trying to do what Christie's could not do, I was overcome by it. People who watched the video said, oh, he's clearly in love with the watch. I liked the watch, but I wasn't in love with the watch. I was in awe of the occasion and, frankly, the responsibility that had been put on my shoulders. So I think in terms of being awestruck, that one, the 6239 Paul Newman Daytona. I would also say this, there have been horological giants 
that that were that were idol watches for me that I eventually reviewed and I think the Zeitwerk is probably a great example of that when we get to the point where a Zeitwerk lumen shows up that will probably be the watch and I would also say realistically whenever that chronomaster XXT open shows up I'm a kid again I it's irrational, but it's inevitable. Jumping into the box right here, thoughts on the Tudor Black Bay Ceramic for Only Watch. Okay, look, it's inevitable. Tudor will be doing ceramic watches. You've already seen it in the Fast Rider. You've seen it in the Only Watch model. This is something they do and will do more. And the reason is because Tudor does what Rolex cannot. Big watches, you got it. Weird watches like the P01, titanium watches, ceramic watches. Tudor does all of that. It's a test bed for things that may someday work for Rolex, but which Rolex, for whatever reason, has too much decorum or propriety or dignity to try out. In essence, Tudor can stoop to the fads that Rolex cannot. And then Lucas O, oh, Tim, what is a watch that you would like to review but haven't yet? You want to know a watch that is just on my mind and I can't get over it. It's the solid dial version of the Zenith Defi El Primero 21, the one that I'm confident they've never sold because I've never seen it. I've seen every version of that watch. I have seen Torbion versions of that watch, but I have not seen the solid dial model, the one that I want most. And I'll also mention another watch that I'm dying to see, and it's been three years, the Piaget 700P, the cushion cased XL spring drive knockoff. That's right, Piaget alone, among all the Richemont companies, Patek Philippe, Richard Mille, Swatch, and ETA, Piaget alone has recreated Spring Drive. So you have the most overlooked of all the Richemont watch brands, and they alone have achieved the world's thinnest watch at two millimeters, the thinnest mechanical watch, and they've achieved Spring Drive. And that Cushion XL, that 700p Spring Drive Piaget is a watch I want to see because I don't even believe it exists. I've never seen one. I have barely seen photos of the watch. I don't know if it was a prototype. I've held the two millimeter cobalt case, Alta Plano, ultimate concept. I've worn it on my wrist. I've shot a video of it. I've never seen that Spring Drive Piaget. And then we have bum, 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 Joshua Polanski, a good friend of the house, saying that Acrivia is awesome. That's a fact. Rajep Rajepi and his brother Zevdet are the next big thing. They are the next FP Journe. I hope they keep production low and they keep the watches exclusive. Check out the Chronomet Contemporain Acrivia to see exactly what I'm talking about. Better than good. Uh, better than sublime. We need a new word. Sublimation surpassed. Acrivia, you're that sharp. And then right here, we've got John Doe saying, damn YouTube, not getting notifications. 6 p.m. on Mondays, right here, you guys know the deal. And then right here, we've also got bum, 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 bum. Alfie saying, my local Rolex ad, AD, I should say, has a discontinued white gold sky dweller with a factory dial change to a steel blue dial. Is that something you've heard of? Emphatically, no. I have never heard of Rolex taking a modern production Rolex watch and swapping out a dial and sending it back to a dealer. I would almost guarantee you that something is amiss there or the watch is actually steel. Bump, bump. And then right here we have Yeti D saying, or asking, why are Moser prices so soft pre-owned? It's simple, guys. Moser prices are soft pre-owned because Moser is an underrated brand. There are probably more watches available than the market can accommodate. And frankly, before the takeover by MELB and the Maylan family, they made way too many watches and they're still suffering from that. Supply and demand, guys. That's what I got. This has been an unusually interactive episode of Watches Tonight, and I've got some parting shots, wrist shots, guys. JCS and a Seiko SRPC39 Mini Turtle with a partial eclipse of the cuff, styling on the wrist, and Jared L and his Rolex Explorer 2, appropriately exploring in a survey of an Icelandic glacier. Wicker Man Alan L pays tribute to the metal gods with his Omega Seamaster 300 meter against a wicker backdrop. And James C. prefers full timber as he puts his Rolex Submariner to work in the yard. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watches on this box. Guys, thanks for joining me. It's been a marathon, but you made it worthwhile. My dream keeps getting bigger and bigger, and it's all thanks to you. Thanks to my crew. Time out, Tim out. Join me on Instagram. Enter to win that Omega Seamaster Railmaster. And thanks for logging on.